Hello and welcome back to another 10 minute turn. I'll be a little bit over 10 minutes on this one using the John Tiller series to have a look at the Napoleonic Warfare. Um, we're going to get a bit more advanced today and have a look at large scale battles and how to handle them, advanced tactics if you like. We're not going to just go so much into tactics of the era, but just how I would approach a large battle. Um, we're in John Tiller campaign Russia here and we're at the Battle of Borodino. Now as you can see from the map straight off there's an awful lot of units and it can be quite overwhelming for somebody that's just starting out to think how on earth am I ever going to play this out. This one is only a 48 turn uh, scenario um, but some scenarios can e easily reach 2, 3, even 400 turns. So we're going to have a look at how I would approach the first turn of this battle and that's probably the longest turn that you'll ever do or potentially the longest turn you'll ever do um, and it's the most in-depth because there's a few things we have to check rather than just jump straight in and start fighting from the off. If we want to win we have to give ourselves a fighting chance. Now the first thing I would suggest to do is actually read up on the battle. Um, I'm not saying become a historian, a military strategist or anything like that but just have a, a, a look at the background, the context, what led up to this battle, the units that were there um, and what actually happened on the day. There is some documentation in John Tudor, as I've mentioned before, that is invaluable. They will break that down for you, what the armies were, who everybody was, the units involved. Um, and I will always strongly suggest to find yourself a good quality, high definition map um, for these large battles and actually print it out and have it next to you. A3 would be ideal, A4, if you've got to use A4, you've got to use A4. Alternatively, you might be an avid war gamer. Um, and decide, no, I want to just play what's in front of me. I don't want to know uh, the disposition of enemy troops. I just want it to be all a big surprise and then use my skills to actually deal with what's in front of you. Um, another good thing is with John Tiller Games is that in the historical scenarios, um, and this is Borodino historical, um, the disposition of all the troops on the field are as they were on the day. The order of the battle are completely accurate. So all the troops in the correct numbers and the correct locations are where they should be. Now even though we're the French in this case, and we've got line of sight or fog of war should I say turned on, we can't see all of the Russian troops and where they are. Because I've got a little bit of historical context, um, and for example the forest down here on the Russians left, it, nice big blank open spaces, but those spaces are going to probably hide troops. Now I know, for example, Markov and his militia are going to be down here. Prince Tchaikovsky is going to be down here somewhere as well. Um, however, once you're playing a human opponent, that might change. They might start in the same positions. Um, however, the human player, your opponent, may decide to actually change those positions. So it will play out slightly differently against a human um, than it would against the AI. The other good thing is with um, John Tiller Games, as I said, that it is very, very historical accurate, historically accurate. So if we were to find the Bagration Redoubts um, somewhere down here, or the Bagration Fletchers, I'm going to know that Voronsov and his Grenadiers are there, so when I approach there, you will find um, Voronsov and his Grenadiers there. Um, so the first thing I do is have a look at the big picture. So this scenario is so big we can't actually fit everybody on one screen so I can go ahead and press the J key to get this jump map up and that will give me a, a, a big picture of the whole battle. You see the French down here we've got some troops, we're quite strong in the centre but on our left flank we haven't got much at all. Um, and the Russians are pretty much strung out, we can't see everywhere especially in the forest of the south like we said. Um, but that's given me the big picture and what we are actually dealing with there. Just go out there. Um, the next thing I've got to do is just basically survey the battlefield, have a look at what we've got. We've got a lot of trees in the centre in between us and the Russians. Looks like they've got a nice defensive position there. On this map the A's represent a Abbas's and if it was a T, T for Tango, that would represent a trench. Can't see any from the top. Um, Another advantage uh, with John Tiller games is they give you so many scenarios that, and a lot of them are small chunks of this battle. So they may break down the Chevrolet-Dino um, redoubts as a small battle. And I would suggest if you're sort of new to the era or even new to John Tiller games, perhaps just playing one of those smaller bite-sized scenarios just so you get used to the system and give yourself a little bit of historical context because that smaller battle, as part of a larger battle, will also be included. Um, but you also have to deal with potentially several smaller battles, if you see what I'm saying. 
Um, and another good thing with all these different scenarios they give you is a historical scenario. So you can play out um, with different troop dispositions, different starting positions, different troops are either going to be there or not there on each side. So even if you do have the historical background and, and you sort of know the battle if you like and what happened, um, it can play out completely differently as well. So there's a lot there for everybody depending on your style, your background and how you like to play your war games. Um, so we're going to survey this battlefield, that's the next thing I'm going to do. Um, and we can see from my map the different shades represent the different heights. So there are some high ground, some low ground, etc, etc. To make it a little bit easier, we can go up to the view button here and show map contours. You can see the sort of thick set brown lines break up those contours a little bit more. Um, there's no personal preference to that, I prefer not to have the contours on just because I can sort of read the map with the colours. Um, and it just adds clutter for me, and I don't like things to be cluttered, so I'm going to take those map consoles off. And um, we went through the jump map, so if we press J, at any point we can just press anywhere on the jump map, and the map will center on that hex that we selected in the jump map. Um, and we're also going to look at potential obstacles as well. It's not all big, clear ground, open fields in every single battle that we have. So we're going to zoom down and have a look. Okay, we've got some trees, we've got some rivers and bridges and marshes here on the left. And um, that's all going to block a potential avenue of approach. Remember, we get disrupted when we cross certain terrain. Our movement points are going to get reduced and it's going to slow down our approach. However, it may come to our advantage because it may be able to mask any avenues of approach depending on what we decide to do later on. Having a look here, we've got a bridge that we have to cross this creek. Um, the small rivers and streams and things, the light blue areas, we can cross on foot or horses or artillery. However, these darker blue creeks here, we're going to have to um, use a bridge. We're not, or we wouldn't be able to actually just cross them hex to hex as we would with the light blue streams here. Um, next thing we can do is zoom out a little bit more and have a look at the units that we're going to be have, uh, we're allowed to play with. Now, rather than click through them individually, one by one, and write them down and, and try to remember them, we can come up to this unit box up here, and we can see if we're going to have any units that are going to arrive. We may receive reinforcements later on in the game, it depends on how the game sets up in the, uh, the historical context. Uh, so what we have on the field might not be all the troops that we end up with at the end of the day. So if we click on this box scheduled, okay, we don't have any reinforcements scheduled for, for this battle. It would appear here there will be a list of which unit, which turn and time they're going to appear, and in which hex they're going to appear as well. But just because we're getting reinforcements, um, we're not going to plough them straight into battle. We have to decide, okay, if they're going to arrive up in this northwest corner, how are we going to best utilize them? Are we going to protect our flank a little bit more? Are we going to bring them into the main body itself? Um, so you've got to think about, right, in 20 turns, these units are going to appear. How am I going to use them? It's going to take them time to uh, march across the map as well. They're not going to just appear on the front line. Um, so you've got to sort of think, almost like uh, chess, a couple of moves ahead, and that can have an effect on your initial actions. All right, we're a little bit weak on the left, but if I make an attack, knowing that in 20, tu 20 turns time, I'm going to have some reinforcements, that may have a, a factor in how I decide to play the battle out. We go back up to units again, um, and we can go to releases. We do have some fixed units in this. I'm just going to highlight them with this F up here. So not every unit is available to us right from the off at the start of the battle. And that's obviously going to have quite a major contributing factor to how we play out our first turn and our initial plans. Fixed units may become unfixed and um, be able to be used by yourself. Um, either if an enemy comes within a certain number of hexes, a, a sort of a proximity release if you like. Maybe it was done by historical time, so mid-morning these troops might be released. Or, if another, if an enemy unit comes close enough and fires on your units, then they will also become unreleased or unfixed. If you like. um, we can change direction with things like that, these fixed units, um, change direction. What we can't do is offensive fire. If these skirmishers were to make their way across the river there and actually come face to face with these units, 
even if they are not unfixed, they probably will the next turn because of the proximity, they will still defensify. So even though we can't move them around or do much with them, um, they will defend themselves if attacked. Um, another thing with the units, if we come up here, is withdrawals. Okay, Hope, gladly nobody will withdraw from this battle. However, it'd be a nasty surprise if you are in the midst of a fight and you're winning, you're gaining an advantage, and then all of a sudden the troops disappear from the map. Historically, um, I, I can't think of it happening too much. I remember one in 1814, or campaign 1814, when uh, Prince Eugene had to go after a certain amount of turns. Um, but rather than get surprised by it, it's worth just looking at the withdrawal dialogue and it will show you which units, double click on them, it will take you to that unit and when they will withdraw from the battle. Um, next thing I'm going to do is have a look at the main body of my army, who have I actually got. So this is rather than clicking through each individual um, unit, I can come here and I can click on strength. Now we can't see the Russian strength because we've got fog of war, however we can see the French strength and it breaks it down into units and divisions so you see we've got the Imperial Guard there and if I was to double click there it should take me to the Imperial Guard, no it doesn't. Um, we've got this on the Young Guard, Old Guard, this in the Legion and you can see the numbers of everybody and breaks it all down. If you go right to the bottom of this box we can see in total we've got just short of 112,000 men. 